Awesome. Well, grab a hand. We're going to pray for the speaker. <laughs> this is for your sake, bro. Trust me. Lord, we bless the speaker, and we bless the hearer, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would touch all of us, that you would open up uh, just new pathways in our hearts, that we, would, that we would be empowered to change the world. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, I started a, a, a series 20 years ago. I've been working on it piece by piece. It's part like 400 called uh, Becoming a Cultural Architect. And I actually did start about a month ago on this subject. So this is part two. Um, Why don't you turn to Isaiah 61. We're going to do a little bit of review. This is called the Messiah's Mandate. This is what Jesus read in Luke 4 when he sat on the chair that hadn't been sat in ever 400 years. And uh, he proclaimed this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. But that, this mandate was, of course, to begin with Christ, but it was also a mandate for us. And I want to read it to you and, how, and, and talk to you about how it relates to becoming cultural architects. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, it writes. But the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to speak release to captives and freedom to prisoners, the favorable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to grant all those who mourn in Zion, give them a garland instead of ashes, a mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting, that they might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So for, for three verses, we have the Holy Spirit on people to get them well, to take people who were broken, captive, shattered minds. In fact, the word, uh, the word uh, uh, brokenhearted is actually the word shattered minds that the Holy Spirit is on us to heal people's minds, to heal their hearts, to set them free, to take people that have no energy, the, that, that spirit of fatigue. I'm going to give you a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. And the Lord's on us to release captives, free prisoners, and heal hearts and heal minds. But look at what the fourth verse says. It says, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations, and they will repair ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. My point is this, who is they? And then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. I'd propose it's the person who were broken, the, person, the people who were captive, the people who had chronic fatigue, the people who were mentally ill. When God, when God heals them, then he sends them back out and says, you, you, you healed, become a healer. You restored, become a restorer. You delivered, become a deliverer. And God takes the people who were once broken and he makes them city changers. He makes them cultural architects. He says, I've anointed you now that you're well, now that you're healed, go out and shape culture towards the kingdom. And this is what we're doing. And I've told my story so many times, I really do get tired of telling it, but I, I, it's the foundation for why I do what I do. I was demonized for three and a half years. I wrote a book about it. By the way, if you go through a hard time, write a book about it. It's better to be miserable and rich than miserable and poor. Because at least you can go shopping. And um, after I, I got delivered, um, I was, uh, you know, when, if you had a robber break in your house, and the police finally came in and captured him, the damage they did to the house is still damaged. You still have to go back and restore the house. And so I spent a lot of years after I got delivered, the Lord putting me back together, had mostly to do with my identity and confidence, confidence in God. And so I spent a, a lot of years, I, I feel like we're all in process where the Lord is deeper and deeper revealing his character and nature in us. But I was about a year and a half out of that uh, season, and uh, we... We, uh, Kathy and I, we, had, we made this agreement after some little struggle that when I came home for work, we, you know, I worked 10-hour days, it was very stressful work, that, you know, of course, the kids, I got three kids at the time, they're like, Daddy, Daddy, play with us, da, da, da. And I'm like, ah, you know. And so um, I, I, we called it the decompression. We, I could decompress for an hour, and that meant I went into the, i say hi to the kids, love on them, then I'd go take a bath for an hour, read my Bible, pray, and after that hour, then the kids were mine for the, the rest of the evening. And, um, and we did that for years and years and years. And I'd, I'd go in there and, and read my Bible, all my Bibles. You know, you know what happens when steam touches pages? And when you underline, you know, it's like women, when they get touched by the Holy Ghost and their mascara runs. So <laughs> my three early Bibles all have the mascara running, Holy Spirit sweat of the, of the uh, bathtub. 
the steam from the bathroom. And uh, I, I just did that for, I don't know, 15 years. I still do it, uh, not every night, but just lay in my bathtub and, and, and pray. And I just like to just be in there and think. And, um, and one day I was doing that, this is about a year and a half after my nervous breakdown, and the Lord walked through my wall. And, and I saw him with my eyes. And by the way, I tell the story over and over. It's only happened to me twice. But you know, if you tell it over and over, people are like, so spiritual. <laughs> and uh, I, I've seen an angel one time in my life, but I tell that over and over. Like, I'm sort of on an angel diet right now because I haven't seen an angel for 15 years. But people just think you're spiritual if you tell them over and over. So the Lord walked through the... <laughs> you didn't even get that. But anyway, first service was like, they're angel depraved also. <laughs> so I, I was in my bathtub and the Lord walks through the wall and he begins to talk to me and he tells me about my future. And I've shared this story several times. And, uh, and he tells me things that were so amazing that I didn't tell anyone for over a year. I didn't even tell my wife for a year. Because um, you know when you're, you're still kind of broken and, you, and the Lord's giving you this big vision and you're like, people are going to say, oh well, that's not you. That wasn't the Lord. I was so concerned that someone would, you know, pop the bubble. So I, I kept it to myself. Uh, and, and, but well, the Lord spoke to me and he said, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. And he said, you're going to talk to presidents and prime ministers and kings and mayors and governors. And you're going to, you're going to, you're going to bring the kingdom into government and you are going to shape the history of nations. And that was just one of the things he told me. And I was you know, obviously in shock, still trying to figure out who I am. And the, the encounter lasted almost a half an hour. And the Lord turned to leave the room and he stopped and he turned back and he walked right over to me and he looked at me and it's one of those things you never forget. I looked into his eyes and I could see the world in his eyes. And he pointed right at me and with a stern face he said, and history will tell us if you believe me. History will tell us if you believe me. 20 years passed. I figured, you know, for sure, President Reagan's going to call me. <laughs> I kept the phone close to me. Hey, if a number comes in you don't recognize, it's for me. <laughs> Nothing happened. 20 years. I never had another word from anyone else about being a prophet to anything, anybody. Never had anybody say, you know, say anything about influencing government. 20 years passed. I came to Bethel. Nothing happened. We, but... We got introduced the first day at Bethel, and Bill brought Kathy and I up, and he said, this is Chris Fallotton. I've known him for 20 years. He's a prophet. Like, first time, I didn't even know he thought that. I'm like, I are. We're no longer a nonprofit organization. <laughs> Most of the church is, but anyway. And, and, you know, everything changed, you know, because the Bible says that prophet has honor except for in his hometown, but this wasn't my hometown. So it was very different. People are like, oh, you're a prophet. I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> I've been anointed in the bathtub. <laughs> Bill finally figured it out, you know. I never did tell Bill that till later. But, uh, and, and so I'm like, so now I'm like, okay, God, someone, someone with authority called me a prophet and the people relate to me. By the way, it's kind of funny. I haven't told this in any service today, but, but the staff started coming in my office and they would stand in my office and confess their sins. <laughs> like I'm a prophet, I'm not the Pope. <laughs> Truthfully, they'd say, oh, you know, I, I want you to know that I've struggled with pornography, but I gave it up three days ago, you know, when you're... Um, uh, the first time I thought, well, that was okay. Be healed. You're good. It happened like 10 times in like two weeks. I'm like, I was telling Kathy, like, this is weird. So finally, I'm like, I stopped. I'm like, I know you can see my sin. I'm like, I'm working on mine, you know? It's all good. But nothing, nothing happened about the nations, mayors, governors, prime ministers. No, none of that happened. And then this lady, I think I was probably about two years, I was in the back. Uh, of the church, and this lady, older lady, very old, probably 50, <laughs> I'm trying to relate to the millennials who are listening on the webcast. 
she comes up to me and she says, you know, I'm really nervous. I, I, I feel like I'm supposed to give you this word, but I, I, I'm so sorry. I feel so nervous. I'm like, yes, what is it? She goes, I had a dream last night and you were in the White House and you were teaching the president the ways of the kingdom. It's the first time anyone acknowledged that I had any, that I was to have any influence. And then I must have had 15 or 16 times that year, people would say, last night I saw that you were with the prime minister. I, I, I saw you in the White House. I, people would just dream that all, over and over. And I began to realize like God spoke to me about between the promise and the palace is the process. You have to wait for the process, you know? And then I began to realize as God began to open the door and we began to meet with you know, different people. We met with uh, 19 um, congressmen last week. But as God began to open the door, I realized like, this isn't for me, this is for us. This isn't, this isn't like one person's gonna influence nations. This is like, we're all called influence nations. I, I'm, I may be one of the leaders in doing that, but how many of you know, that means there's other people following to do the same. So I want to talk to you today about becoming a cultural architect. If you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, I want to talk a little bit about a war. There's a war over who will shape the mindset of the masses and therefore form culture. I want to say that one more time. There is a massive war over who will shape the mindset of the masses and therefore form culture. Ephesians 6.10, finally, Paul writes, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, everybody say struggle, is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers. Everybody say rulers. rulers. Against powers. Everybody say powers. powers. Against world forces of darkness. Come on, world forces of darkness. Against spiritual forces, come on, of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist an evil day and having done everything to stand, stand firm. This is a, an interesting passage because if you read the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about for five chapters how we are victors. He said we already received every spiritual blessing, this is Ephesians 1, in heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has already been given to you. Chapter 2 says, we've been raised up and seated with heavenly places in Christ, far above all principalities and powers, and every name that's named. Chapter 3 says that we have the manifold wisdom of God, and it's going to be displayed to principalities and powers, and God's going to teach his wisdom through his people to principalities and powers. Chapter 4 says he's anointed apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of service to change the world. Chapter 5 says he's anointed us and he's become our husband to a bride. And then chapter 6 he goes, but we're going to struggle. And I'd propose that the struggle is not against demons, as I've heard people commonly teach. Paul is not saying, and I'm struggling against demons. He's saying world changers, I'm a world changer and I am struggling, I am warring against a world force of darkness. How many know world changers aren't dealing with demons? World changers are dealing with principalities. There are principalities, and he names four of them here. And I'm convinced there's probably others, but he names four principalities here, and he says, these principalities, we are warned against these principalities, and he says in chapter two that we were once under the prince of the power of the air that is still working in the sons of disobedience. In other words, people are not thinking for themselves. Something else, you know what a familiar spirit is? It's a spirit, it's an evil spirit that is so common to you, you don't even know it's thinking for you. And Paul says that there is a spirit that is working its way into society and it is, it, it is trying to be the cultural architect of the world. This first one is very interesting where it says, um, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, verse 12. But it's against rulers. Um, some of your uh, Bibles will say principalities. It will call the first one principalities. The actual word there is the word origin. In other words, it says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against origin. It calls this spirit origin. Now, okay, you're like, what does that mean? Okay, you know when Jesus cast out like a deaf and dumb spirit, and all of a sudden the boy could speak and hear? Why did he call it a deaf and dumb spirit? Because 
Evil spirits are named after the influence they have on humans. So, you know, we name someone John, Jane, Mary. We're like, oh, we like the name. But a name means something in the spirit realm. So when this spirit calls itself origin, it, it's determining what its assignment is against the planet. It is redefining the origins. Now, let me give you an example. The same word origin, Paul writes in Philippians 4.15, you yourselves know Philippians at my first preaching, the word first preaching in Philippians. Paul says, you know the first preaching I did there? That word first preaching is actually origin. It's the same Greek word origin. <laughs> okay, you're like, what does this mean? What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that Paul was saying, when I was laying the foundations, the origins, I was giving you the foundations of the kingdom. But there's a spirit, an evil spirit, that is also redefining origin. Let me give you an example. This spirit, this, this origin spirit says, are you really made in the image of God? Or are you an evolutionized ape? See, what's the problem with evolution? Well, the problem is, is that it takes you out of being a son or a daughter and it makes you an, a smart ape. You know why? Because origin doesn't want you to believe that God's your dad. It says, it says, or it says, or is that really a child or is it a fetus? See, that's just a fetus. Oh, it looks like a baby on a sonogram. And yes, we can take the organs and ship in and sell them, but it's not really a baby. It's a fetus. How about this one? Are you really a boy? Maybe you're a girl. Yes, you, you have a penis. Yes, you, your DNA says, you know, if we can take a DNA test and we can say, oh yes, you're definitely a boy, but maybe you're a girl. Are you supposed to marry the opposite sex? Why can't you just choose what sex you want to marry? These are all the work of origin. This is what happens when really intelligent people, you would trust them, they might be your doctor, they might be your counselor, there might be someone, an engineer, someone you really trust, but in this one subject, someone else is teaching them. And have you noticed how irrational it is? Evolution, just add a billion years, and it all makes total sense. Think about it. It's like nobody created you. You just happened. How did that happen? Over a billion years. <laughs> oh. Perfect sense. <laughs> Two Volkswagens ran into each other and a Corvette drove out. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Oh, oh, wait. It took a billion years. Oh. Gosh, I thought you were being totally irrational. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10 says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh, but the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Are you with me? My Bible says fortresses. They are mighty for the pulling down of fortresses. What are the names of the fortresses? Thoughts, speculations, and lofty things. You know what, a, you know what a, a, a speculation is? A what if. What if? Did God say, did God say that if you eat that tree, you'll die? Oh no, you're not gonna die. You'll be like God. Yeah, then, you know, are you really, are you really a child of God? Nah, nah, you used to be an ape. Look, you even have hair on your back. How, you remember when you, you can't, you can't even pass a banana without eating it. <laughs> I was being funny there, of course. And my point really is that speculations are often predicated by a spirit. Have you, have you ever had your wife come home late and, or she's late and you're like, she, something's wrong. And have you ever got so afraid you know, when you get, you get afraid and fear is like drinking, like being drunk. You start making up stories. Maybe aliens abducted her. <laughs> and then she finally comes home two hours later. Where were you? I was calling the UFO department to see if you got sucked up. 
on your spaceship. She said, remember I told you I was going to go shopping after I work? You text me those things. You do not. You do not allow me to remember those things. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that almost all our speculations, I'm just being funny, of course. Have you ever noticed that almost all our speculations are, are negative? Yeah. You know why? Because you're not thinking for yourself. See, as soon as you get afraid, you tapped in to origin, and you said, redefine the purposes of God for me. Romans 8, 37 says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors in him. Do you know you can't conquer what you don't confront? You're more than a conqueror. Would that not say that you were born for battle? Did you notice it didn't say, and you are more than comforters? <laughs> it says the Holy Spirit's a comforter. Why does it say he's a comforter and I'm a conqueror? I need a comforter because I'm always in battle. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ. No soldier in active service engages himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. How many know you're a son or daughter, but you are commissioned in the army of God? Uh, you, do you know, uh, you ever seen an orange tree? You ever seen orange trees straining to make oranges? Just try to make an orange. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm trying to make an orange if trees can talk. No, they just make oranges. You know why? They were created to make oranges. Now, they may want to be an apple tree. May even think they're an apple tree. <laughs> anyway, okay, that was just a joke. But I, I'm saying, they don't try to make oranges. They just make oranges. You know why? By divine design, they were created to make oranges. You were created for battle. You're like, oh, it so stresses me out. No, what stresses you out is running from the battle. Because the armor of God is all for the front of you. You have a breastplate of righteousness. You have loins covered. Truth. Helmet of salvation. You ain't got nothing on your butt. Back. Back. You know why? The Lord's your rear guard. He follows you into battle. I'm simply saying, when you're stressed, it isn't because you're in a battle. It's because you're running from the battle. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, it says, it, it opens with this. In the spring, when kings go out to war, David sent Joab and stayed home. You know what the rest of that story is? He was up on his castle wall looking down at Bathsheba. She was in a bath. That's why she's called Bathsheba. <laughs> to explain these things to people that don't understand theology. And it becomes the worst failure in David's life. He ends up getting her pregnant, as you know. They lose the child. He kills her husband, named Uriah. You know what Uriah's name means? The Lord is my fire. Do you know that Uriah was one of the 33 mighty men of David? David kills the man whose name, my God is my fire, and his fire goes out in his life. But you know what the real problem was? He mistook the season. When kings go out to war, he stayed at home, but the protection went out to war. How many of you know, you want to take a sabbatical when it's a season to rest, but you don't want to take a sabbatical when it's a season to fight, because you were born to fight. Your protection is in the anointing for the season you're supposed to be in. The safest place to be is where God is. You're like, God's everywhere, come on, bad theology. You understand what I mean? Where God has ordained you to be, that's the safest place to be. You know in our history, those of us that are Americans, God bless America, do you know that George Washington, the founder of our country, you know that he was never wounded in battle? Do you know that twice he went out, came back with bullets through his coat, front of his coat, and out the back, and never wounded? 
In the American Indian War, the Native Americans said of Washington, he must be a spirit because he can't be killed. In the, in, this is a true story. Go, go check it out. In the, 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 there was, there's lots of historians that believe that the Brits actually gave up on America, surrendered, left our country, because there was words going out to the British king that Washington couldn't be killed. At one point, his men ran off, and he stood on a, on, on a cliff, and the British army was down below. They got up, and they emptied their, their muzzles against Washington. And Washington just stood on his horse and watched them. And, and then he rode off. And as he rode off, the British soldiers got up and clapped. <laughs> Definitely not for their marksmanship. I'm simply trying to point out that if God calls you to battle, if he calls you as a founder of a country, you haven't finished your call, you are perfectly safe. Unless you don't show up where God calls you to show up. I think so much stress happens because we refuse to engage. God says engage, we go, I don't do confrontation. He goes, I do, and I'm in you. You're more than a conqueror, engage. I wanna say that I see Christians running away from culture in the name of all kinds of things. Love, I just love people, I, just, I don't wanna tell them they're doing anything wrong. Yeah, they're dying, and they're teaching your children how to die. Now they've done it in the school system. Now all your kids have to go through, this is how to die. Here's 20 ways to die. And you're still like, I just don't want to, oh, I just don't want anyone to write a bad Facebook post about me. What am I going to do if they, if they protest my house? You're going to be on fire. <laughs> you were born for this. It's going to make you alive. Now, if you go out as an idiot, and God doesn't call you to do it, it's going to be stressful. You know, if you go out in your own strength, you're like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to show them how mad I am. You, you, you're just going to be totally stressed out. But God sends you. If God says, do it this way. If God says, start a tech company and let leaven flow in to the information gate, then do it. <laughs> oh, something goes wrong. Well, what if it doesn't? <laughs> What if I die? You're all gonna die. <laughs> if I said, stand up for your terminal, you should all stand up, you're all gonna die. The question is, are you really gonna live? You know, if you spend your days trying to save your life, you'll never really live. Men don't follow titles, they follow courage. <laughs> <laughs> Bad rendition of Braveheart. Okay, I want to, I have a few more minutes. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about this whole culture shaping thing. You, you know that each one of us will give an account for our life. There is a judgment day. It's called great and terrible. Great if you're on the right side, terrible if you're not, right? <laughs> and I will stand before God by myself in front of God, and God will take me through my life, and I won't be able to say, well, Kathy made me do that, or... Gosh, I had a bad dad. I will have to give an account for what I did, not for what people did against me. And I, and I get that, and, and, and even that seems totally normal and rational to me. But there's another judgment that I have ignored my entire life until two months ago. And I started reading it, and I'm like, this doesn't make sense, and let me read it to you. Uh, it's in Matthew 25. I'm sure you've read it before. And for me, it's one of those speed bumps. It's like, you ever read scripture and you're like, I don't know what that means. I'm not even going to ask. It's one of those. And it says this, but when the son of man comes, it's verse 31, in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the glorious throne, on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate uh, from one another, them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was thirsty and you, uh, I was thirsty, I was thirsty and I was, I'm sorry, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink and so on and so forth. 
And then he'll say to those on the left the opposite. He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. And it says, and they will enter, depart from me, you accused ones, into eternal fire, which prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink, and so on and so forth. Uh, the point I'm, I, I'm trying to make and is, did you notice that there is a personal judgment, but there's also a corporate church judgment? Like, I'm going to be judged with a group of other people. I'm like, how do you do that? Like, what if I'm a sheep, but I'm in a goat nation? <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? Like, 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 that doesn't seem fair. I'm like, oh, I died in the wrong nation. And then I'm like, let's see, do I get judged in the nation I was born in or the one I died in? You know, you're looking at me like... And, and then I, I was asking the Lord this uh, for, for months. I, I felt like the Holy Spirit highlighted this. And I, and, I, and I heard the Lord say to me, there can't be corporate judgments without collective responsibility. God wouldn't hold me accountable for something he didn't equip me to influence. And therefore, we are responsible for the mindsets of nations as we have been called to influence the way they think. What I'm getting at is this. Do you, you read the Old Testament, and it says, there was a wicked king. And it says, all of Israel, all of Israel went after Baal. It doesn't say they pretended to. It says they did. And then when they got a righteous king, it says, and all of Israel served the Lord. Am I making any sense? I'm saying one person served God and it infected and affected the way the entire nation thought. The entire nation served the Lord because one guy had a relationship with God. Another guy has a relationship with the demonic spirit, and all the nation serves the demonic spirit. And they would flip-flop, like literally flip-flop, between serving God and serving Baal, and it was almost always predicated on who was leading. And what I'm getting at is this, is that the reason why God judges people collectively is because we collectively think together. It's called, it's called a mindset or culture. And what I'm getting at is that God judges culture collectively because we have responsibility to influence culture collectively. If you're like, well, I'm a sheep, but I'm in a goat nation, God goes, why did I put one sheep in a goat nation? Did I put a sheep in a goat nation to judge the sheep or to change the goats? Well, I'm just one person. God's only looking for one person. God isn't president of presidents. He's king of kings. He didn't get voted in. Okay, Old Testament. Old Testament, right? Didn't have the Holy Spirit in people. Didn't, wasn't born again. You get the idea. Definitely didn't have the advantage we have. The greatest in the Old Testament was John the Baptist. The least in the kingdom is greater than John. I'm trying to say you have an advantage over anyone in the Old Testament, right? Daniel, Meshach, Abednego. Who did I miss? Shadrach. Sorry. Four guys get taken captive, POWs, actually their whole families do. Nebuchadnezzar tears down, destroys Israel, tears down the temple, and takes all these people captive, including these four boys. What happens over 70 years? They transform two evil nations, Babylon and Persia. How did they do it? Four guys served the Lord and changed a nation Babylon, which to the, to the book of Revelation is a sign of a demonic kingdom, actually served the Lord under Daniel. Do you know that? And he was a slave. And he didn't have the Holy Ghost. You're like, well, I'm, I'm not a king. Neither was he. He was a prisoner of war. How about this one? He influenced, remember he lived through four kings? So when the Persians conquered the Babylonians, Daniel was still there, 70 years, right? And the last king that he influenced was named Cyrus. Do you know that the United Nations has a, a um, civil rights document that they use to determine the rights of, of people? And do you know who wrote that document? Cyrus. You know who influenced that document? Daniel. Do you know that Daniel's influence is still going into the nations today? Why? Because one man had a relationship with God. 
I'm simply saying the reason why God judges us collectively is because we have collective responsibility. If I'm in an evil kingdom, I don't have to come under that spirit because I am seated in heavenly places with Christ. How many understand that there are principalities and powers in heavenly places, but they're in the second heaven. You're in the third heaven, and everything's under your feet. What's that mean? The highest ranking demon in the second heaven is still under the feet of the third heaven. You say, well, I don't feel powerful. Well, it's not about feelings, it's about faith. You understand that any, hope, any thought in you that doesn't inspire hope is rooted in a lie? We are called to make disciples of nations. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.10, oh, almost out of time, 1 Corinthians 3.10, he said, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. The word master builder is one word in the Greek. It's the word architectron. You know what English word comes from the word architectron? Architect. Paul said, I am an architect and I'm laying a foundation. How many know origin is laying a foundation? But we are laying a foundation. We are not railing against a people group. We are warring against the spirit that is infecting a people group. Are you following me? Okay, I want to finish this. How many know you're the light of the world? Somebody once said, in fact, in the first service I said, how many know you're the light of the world? The world's going to get darker and darker and the church is going to get brighter and brighter. Can I get an amen? Everybody amen. I said, you amen for the wrong thing. We're not the light of the church. We're the light of the world. If the world's getting darker and darker, well, the church gets brighter and brighter. How many know we misplace the light? Jesus never said you're the light of the church. In fact, he said, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Then he goes on to say, you're a city on a hill that can't be hidden. The point is, he said, I put you on a high place so that you can light the world. How many of you know, if the church is getting brighter and brighter, where the world's getting darker and darker, someone covered the light. I propose that the church has become a lamp shade instead of a lamp stand. And then we create theologies to make it okay. Well, you know, the Bible says, bro, devil's going to come. I don't know the devil I, I know about got defeated at the cross. He has no power over me. I have power over him. Oh, well, he's going to come. He's going he's gonna, to, gonna, you know what? I'm going to be the happiest person the beast ever ate if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'll have to skip everything else I was going to say. And I want to read you, I want to take a few minutes to read you an article that was in the San Francisco Chronicle, San Francisco Chronicle, on May 21st, 2019. I'm going to read you just a part of it. The title of the article is, Is This Heaven or Reading? The Shasta County city of 91,000 is home to a church, Bethel, with 11,000 members and a commitment to a community so intense it's almost supernatural. No institution in our state is better at engaging with its hometown. Well, the experts say civil engagement is supposed to be strategic, planned, and targeted at specific issues, Bethel's engagement with Reading is big and broad, touching almost every aspect of civil life. It is, it is grounded not in the language of activism, but in a celebration of love, the love of God and of this place that they live and the people in that place. This lack of structure in Bethel's as assistance to its hometown suggests a broader lesson for, the commu for community building. Stop overthinking things and just throw yourself, heart and soul, into addressing the needs of people. When, the civic, when Reading Civic Auditorium was failing, Bethel helped, uh, Bethel helped put together a nonprofit called Advanced Reading to fix its management. When the Reading Police Department was going to lay off four officers, Reading, Bethel raised money to keep the cops on. After the car fire destroyed more than 1,000 residents last summer, Bethel gave $1,000 in cash to every family, church member or not, that lost a home. Bethel is also connected Reading to the world. Bethel, which has a global disaster response team and a Christian music uh, collective with international reach, helped persuade United Airlines to start a daily nonstop service between LAX and Reading this last month. The Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, a national leader in attracting foreign students, has helped internationalize the city. 
Bethel inspires service with two big messages. First, it teaches that through God, individuals can triumph over, over challenges and experience miracles. Second, the church constantly celebrates Reading and highlights the opportunity to join the community projects. Bethel really, uh, this is a quote, Bethel really encourages everyone to take ownership of the area, to live your faith in a way that's felt, says Mayor Julie Winter, who was in our first service, and she stood and we all clapped for her. <laughs> Bethel says that God is for you, and if God is for you, then who can be against you? I think Jesus said that. So, <laughs> I'll have to work on the mayor's theology. So why not start a new business? Why not volunteer to make the city amazing? Why not, in my case, run for city council? Bethel founded as a small, it goes on to talk about our, our, um, our, our founding um, tenants, uh, and says Bethel is also controversial. <laughs> Some Christians complain that Bethel deviates too far from mainstream Christianity, and they do th weird things like healing and fire tunnels. <laughs> I love it. Fire tunnels. <laughs> the notion that Bethel is, oh, here we go. Um, with Reading, Bethel's growth has raised public concerns about whether the church is trying to take over the town. But around town, many view Bethel as heaven sent. Its theology may be a little strange, but where would this city be without it? Usually, when my phone rings, here's a quote. Usually when my phone rings, somebody wants something from me, says Police Chief Roger Moore. But when they call, it's always to ask if we need anything. They have never asked me for anything. It goes on to talk about the building we're building, and it ends with this. I always had great ideas. He's quoting uh, somebody. I always had great ideas, but it wasn't until I got into this environment that they asked me what I was going to do about it. This community is a place where you can realize lifelong dreams. And he ends this. He ends with this statement, in Reading as it is in heaven. Good word. Why don't you stand? That's just a good word right there. Good news. Put your hand on your heart and say, I was born to change the world. I am more than a conqueror. I am not afraid of conflict. I was born for conflict. I have armor for conflict. I have a comforter for conflict. I was born to transform the world. I am a cultural architect, a child of the king. I move in wonders and signs and miracles to benefit my city. I love my city. My city is a city that God cares about. It's a prosperous city. It's a loving city. It's a city where people get healed and delivered. And it is a city where dreams come true. If you want your dreams to come true, come to my city. Amen. That's a good word right there.